from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium 2019, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. You're watching The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. We're here covering the MIT CDO conference, MIT CDO IQ. Day two, we're wrapping up. Bob Parr is here. He's a partner and principal at KPMG and he's joined by Srikar Krishna, who's the Managing Director of Data Science, AI, and Innovation at KPMG. Gents, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's start with your roles. So, Bob, where do you focus? My focus, uh, I, within uh, KPMG, we've got you know, three main business lines, audit, tax, and advisory, and so I'm the advisory chief data officer. So I'm more focused on how we use data competitively in the market, more the offense side of, of uh, our focus. So you know, how do we make sure that our, our teams have the data they need to deliver value uh, as much as possible, work in concert with the enterprise the CDO, uh, who's more focused on our infrastructure, our standards, and you know, security, privacy, and those. So you're focused on, on making KPMG better. Uh, right. As opposed to <laughs> exactly. KPMG's clients, okay. I also have a second hat, and I also serve financial services CDOs as well, so. Okay, it's, uh, so it's you get dragged, kind of a dual uh, role. dragged out yeah. to, to by the sales guys exactly. a lot. Exactly. <laughs> and Srikar, uh, wh what's your role? Yeah, you know, uh, I focus a lot on data science, uh, artificial intelligence, and overall innovation. Uh, so my, uh, we actually, I actually represent a center of excellence within KPMG that focuses on AI, machine learning, natural language processing, and uh, I work with Bob's uh, division to actually advance the data side of the story, because all AI needs data, <laughs> and without data, <laughs> there is no algorithms. Yeah. Um, so and we are focusing a lot on how do we use AI to make data better. Um, think about data quality, think about uh, data lineage, think about all of the problems that data has. How can we make it better using algorithms? And I focus a lot on that working with Bob. So, so Bob, focus on internal data, KPMG, or your customers? Data? No, it's, it's customers and internal. I mean, you know, I, uh, we are a horizontal within the firm, so we help customers, we help internal, we focus a lot on the market. So, so Bob, you mentioned uh, use data uh, you know, offensively, so mm -hmm. you know, 10, 12 years ago it was, data was a liability, mm -hmm. you had to get you know, rid of it, you keep it no longer than you had to, because you're going to get sued, mm -hmm. so email archive mm -hmm. came in, and, and obviously things flipped after the big data mm -hmm. meme took off, but, mm -hmm. but so what are, you, what are you seeing in terms of that shift from, from the defensive yeah, use of data to the offensive uses, what yeah. does that all mean? Yeah, and it's, it's really, you know, when you think about, and let me define sort of offense versus defense, so on the defense side, you know, historically, that's where most of the CDOs have, have played. That's you know, risk, regulatory, reporting, privacy, um, even litigation support, those types of activities. Today, uh, and, and really until about a year and a half ago, we really saw most CDOs still really anchored in that. Mm -hmm. I run a forum with uh, a number of uh, CDOs in financial services, and every year we get them together and we ask them the same set of questions. This was the first year where they said that, you know what, my primary focus now is growth. It's bringing efficiency, it's trying to generate value on the offensive side. Um, it's not like the regulatory work's going away, certainly in the, the face of some of the, the pending privacy regulation, but you know, it's, it's a sign that the, the volume of use cases as the investments in their digital transformations are starting to kick up as well as the volumes of data that are available, the raw material that's available to them in terms of third party data, in terms of the, uh, the, the, just the, the general um, uh, you know, volumes that, that exist that are streaming into the organization, and the overall literacy in the business units are creating this, this massive demand, and so they're having to respond. Is, is this, do you think, uh, because they're getting a handle on the data, they're actually finding where it is, they're categorizing it, they're, they're uh, yeah, organizing I, it? That, that is still, still a challenge. Um, I think it's better with when you have a very narrow scope, of critical data elements, uh, going back to the, the structured data that we were uh, talking about with the regulatory reporting. When you start to get into the, the, uh, the offense, the generating value, getting into customer experience, you know, really exploring 
you know, that side of it, there's, there's a ton of new muscle that has to be built. Um, new muscle in terms yeah. of data quality, right. new muscle in terms of um, really a more scalable operating model. I, I think that's a big issue right now with, with CDOs is, you know, we've got a, we're, we're used to that limited swath of CDEs and they've got a stewardship network that's very labor intensive, a lot of manual processes still. Um, and, and, and they have some good basic technology, but it's a lot of it's rules-based. And it, when, you, when you think about those con how that constraint's going to scale when you have all of this demand, you know, when you look at the customer experience, analytics that they want to do, when you look at, you know, just look, uh, AI applied to things like operations, the, the demand uh, and the focus there is is uh, is is going to start to create a, a you know fundamental shift. So, Srikar, yeah. one of the things that I, I've seen, and maybe it's just a, my small observation space, but I wonder if you could comment, is this seems like many CDOs are not directly involved mm. in the AI initiatives of the organization. Yes. Clearly, the yes. chief digital officer yeah. is involved, but yeah. the CDOs are kind of you know, in the background still, yeah. are you seeing that? Is that you changing? know, th that's a fantastic question, and I think this is where we are seeing some of the cutting edge change that is happening in the industry, and when Bob represented the idea that we can offensively look at data, uh, this is what it is, that CDOs for a long time have become more reactive in their roles, and that is, that is starting to come f forefront now. So a lot of institutions we are working with are asking, what's the next generation role of a CDO? and why are they in the background and why are they not in the foreground? And this is when you become more offensive or proactive with data and the digital officers are obviously focused on you know, the transformation that has to happen, but the CDOs are their backbone in order to make that transformation real. And if the CDOs start to think about their data as an asset, data as a product, data as a service, the, the digital officers are right there because those are the real, uh, you know, like the day-to-day -day that they are living. So CDO can really become from a back office to really become a business line. So um, who we, do you see taking the reins in machine learning, in machine learning projects in the companies you work with? Who is driving that? Yeah, great question. So we are seeing like, you know, uh, different, uh, I would put them in buckets, right? There is no one model fits all. Uh, we are seeing different uh, generations within the companies. Some of the ones who are just testing out the market, they are still keeping it in their technology space, in their back office tech IT and mm -hmm. you know and and forward IT, let me call that, <laughs> uh, where they are starting to experiment with this. But you see the mature organizations on the other end of the spectrum, they are integrating machine learning and AI right into the business line, because they want the CXOs having the technology right by their side so they can le uh, leverage AI and machine learning sp right for the business, right there. And that is uh, where we are seeing now some of the new models come out. I, I think the big shift from a CDO perspective is using AI to prep data for AI. That's, that's yes. fundamentally where you know, I, where the data science was distributed, some of that data science has to come back. And so for data integration, for data quality. Yeah, for data yeah. prepping, because you've got all this data, third party and, and other from customers yeah. streaming into the organization. And, you know, the work that you're doing around um, anomaly detection I is, it transcends developing the, the rules, doing the profiling, doing the rules, you know, the very manual, the very, uh, you know, labor intensive process. Mm -hmm. You got to get away mm -hmm. from that. So you thought about using in order for this you know, to be scalable. algos and AI to figure out which algos to apply? To, to, s to clean the, d to prepare the data, to see what algorithms we can use. Yeah. So it's basically what we are calling AI mm -hmm. for data, rather than just data leading into AI. So mm -hmm. it's, I mean, you know, we, developed a technology for one of our clients and it's a pretty large financial service, they were getting close to like a billion data points every day. And there was no way manually you could go through the same quality controls and all of those processes. So we automated it through algorithms. And these algorithms are learning the behavior of data as they flow into the organization. And they are able to proactively tell where problems are starting to emerge. And this is the new phase that we see in, uh, in the industry. You cannot scale the traditional data governance 
using manual processes. We have to go to that next generation where AI, natural language processing, and think about unstructured data, right? I mean, that is like 90% of the organization mm -hmm. is unstructured data. And we have not talked about data quality, we have not talked about data governance for a lot of these sources of information. Now is the time, AI yeah. can do it. And, and I think that raises a great question as you look at unstructured and a lot of the, the data sources as you start to take more of an offensive stance will be unstructured. And the data quality, what it means to apply data quality isn't the, the profiling and the rules generation the way you would with standard data. So the teams, the skills that CDOs have in their organizations have to change. Yeah. You have to start to, you know, and you know, it's a great example where, you know, you guys are ingesting documents and there was handwriting all over the documents, you yeah. know, and. You yeah, know. No, yeah, great example, Bob. Like, you know, we, we would ask the client, like, you know, is this document going to scan into the system so my algorithm can run? And they're like, yeah, yeah, everything is good. I mean, the data is there. Yeah. But when you then start scanning it, you realize there's handwriting and the information is in the handwriting. Yeah. So all the algorithms break down. Now yeah, how do tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge, exactly, yeah. exactly. Right. So that's what we are seeing. Uh, you know, if, I, if we talk about the digital transformation mm -hmm. in data, in the CDO organization, it is this idea that nothing is left unseen. Some algorithm or some technology has seen everything that is coming into the organization, has, has, a, has a pair of eyes on it, so it can tell you where the problems are. And this is what algorithms do, they scale beautifully. So the, the, so. the data quality approaches are, are, mm -hmm. ev are evolving, sort of changing. Yeah. Uh, so rather than you know, a heavy, heavy emphasis on masking or deduplication yes. and things like that you would traditionally think of participating in the data quality, not that that goes away, but it's got to evolve to use machine intelligence. Right. Exactly. So yes. what kind yeah. of skill sets do people yeah. need to mm -hmm. achieve that? Is it is it the same people, or do we need to retrain them, or bring in new skills? Or yeah, no, great question, and uh, um, you know, I, I can talk from the, mm -hmm. the perspective of where uh, AI is disrupting every industry now that we know, right? Uh, but when you when you look at what skills are required, um, all of AI, including natural language processing, machine learning, still require human in the loop, and that is the training that goes in there. And who, do you, who are the people who have that knowledge? It is the business analysts, mm -hmm. it's the data analysts who are the knowledge bearers. The C-suite and the CDOs, mm -hmm. they are able to make decisions, but the day-to-day -day is still with the data analysts. Those SMEs. Those SMEs. Mm -hmm. So we have to mm -hmm. upskill them to really start yeah. interacting with these new technologies where they are the leaders rather than just waiting for answers to come through. And when that happens now, me as a data scientist, my job is easy because the SMEs are there, I deploy the technology, the SMEs train the algorithms on a regular basis, then it is a fully fungible model which is evolving with the business. And no longer am I spending time re-architecting my rules and like my, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are the masking capabilities I need mm -hmm. to have, it is evolving as the business and does, grows. And does that change the number one problem that you hear from data scientists, which is that 80% of their time is spent on wrangling yes. data and cleaning data, yes. you know, 10, 15, 20% <laughs> yeah. on yeah. fun stuff? Do you run into SMEs being concerned that they're going to be replaced by the machine they're training? Um, I actually see them being really enabled now. Yeah where they are spending 80% of the time doing boring job <laughs> of looking at data, now they're spending 90% of their time looking at the mm -hmm. elements which are creative mm -hmm. and which requires human intelligence to say, hey, this is different because of X, Y, and Z. So let's, let's yeah. go out, it sounds like a lot of what machine learning is being used for now in your domain is, yeah. is to clean things up, it's plumbing, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's basic foundation work. So go out three years after all that work has been done, and the data is clean, where are your clients talking about going next with machine learning? Uh, Bob, did you want to take I, I, I mean, it's a whole, it, it varies by, by industry, obviously, but, um, but it, it, it covers the gamut from, you know, and, and it's generally tied to what's driving their strategies. So if you look at a financial services organization as an example today, you're going to have uh, you know, really AI driving a lot of the behind the scenes on the customer experience 
um, it's, you know, you know today with your credit card company, it's behind the scenes doing fraud detection, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's going to continue. So it's, it's when you take the, the critical functions that, um, you know, where more data, it, it makes better models, that, you know, that, that's just going to explode. And, and I think they're, they're really, you can look across all the functions from finance to, uh, to marketing, to operations. I mean, it's, it's going to be pervasive across, you know, all of that. So if I may add on top of yeah. what Bob was saying, I think what's going to, what, what, what our clients are asking is, how can I accelerate the decision making? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, all we, all, our leaders are focused on making decisions. Mm -hmm. And all of this data science is leading up to the decision. And today you see like, you know, what you brought up, like 80% of the time is wasted in cleaning the data. So only 20% time was spent in real experimentation and analytics. Mm -hmm. So your decision making time was reduced to 20% of the effort that I put in the pipeline. What if now I can make it 80% of the time that I put in the pipeline, mm -hmm. better decisions are gonna come on mm -hmm. the other end. So when I go into a meeting and I'm saying like, hey, can you show me what happened in this particular region or in this particular part of the country? Previously, it would have been like, oh, can you come back in two weeks? I will have the data ready and I will I'll tell you the answer. But in two weeks, the business has ran away and the CDO now, or the C-suite doesn't require the same answer. But where we are headed is as the data quality improves, you can get to real time questions and decisions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. decision support, business intelligence. That's right, yeah. yes. Well, you know, we're getting better as an industry. It used to be six months to build a cube, right? <laughs> now it's right. two weeks, right. still, yes. still not good enough. Yes. We're moving too fast. As the saying goes, data is plentiful, insights aren't. Yes. Yeah. You know, in your view, will, will, will machine intelligence you know, finally close that gap and get us to, you know, closer to real time decision making? It, it will eventually, but there's there's so much that um, we need to, uh, our industry needs to understand first and it really ingrain. And, and, you know, today there is still uh, fundamental trust issues with AI. You know, it's, we've done a lot of work. Why, because trying it's to black box or? Yeah, you know, part of it, part of it. I, I think, you know, the research we've done and, and some of this is, you know, nine countries, um, 2,400 senior executives, and we ask them a, a lot of questions around uh, their data and trust and analytics. And, you know, 92% of them came back with, they have some fundamental trust issues with uh, their data and their analytics. And, th and they feel like there's reputational risk, material right. reputational right. risk. This isn't getting one little number wrong on one of the reports. Yeah, That's a more of a systemic faster. issue. Now, we also do a CEO study, and we've done this uh, many years in a row. Going back to 2017, we started to ask them, okay, making, a lot of companies are data-driven, right? When it comes to- Or they say they're data-driven. Well, they say they're data-driven, <laughs> and that's the point. Uh, at the end of the day, they, they're making strategic decisions where you have an insight that's not intuitive. Do you trust your gut, or do you go with the analytics? <laughs> Back then, you know, 67% said they go with their gut. So, okay, this is 2017. This industry is moving quickly. There's tons and tons of investment. Look at it in 2018. Go down? No, it went up. 78% They haven't read money they ball, huh? it. So it's not an awareness issue. There are, is something more fundamentally yes. wrong, and you hit it on, it's a it, part of it's black box. And part of it's the data quality, and yeah. part of it's bias, and there's there's all of these things flowing around it. And so when we dug into that, we said, well, okay, if that exists, how are we going to help organizations get their arms around this issue and start digging into that that trust issue? And and really, it's it, the front part is is exactly what we were talking about in terms of data quality both structured, more traditional approaches, and unstructured, using the handwriting example in those types of techniques. But then you get into the models themselves, and it's, you know, the critical things you got to worry about is, you know, w the lineage, so from an integrity perspective, where's the data coming from, what are the sources, what are the change controls on some of that. They need to look at explainability, again, at the black box part, where, you know, can you tell me the inferences, the decisions? You know, are those documented? And this is important for the SME, the human in the loop, to get confidence in the algorithm, as well as, 
you know, that executive group, yeah. so they understand there's a structured set of processes around that. And, and the Moneyball problem is actually pretty confined. It's pretty straightforward. You got, I don't know, 32 teams or throw in minor leagues, but the data model is pretty consistent. True. Um, the, the problem with organizations is the da no data model is consistent in no? any organization. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned risk, Bob. Yeah. The other problem is organizational inertia. If, if they don't trust yes. it, mm -hmm. hey, what, is, what, is a, what does a P&L manager do when, when he or she wants to preserve yeah. you know, their yeah. existing position? They attack the data. Yeah. You know, I don't no, believe that. Well, which is uh, a fundamental point, which is culture. Is, right. yes. I mean, you can, you can have all the data science and all the governance that you want, but if you don't work culture in parallel with all this, it's, it's not going to stick. Um, and, and, and that's, I think the, a lot of the leading organizations are starting to really dig into this. We hear a lot about literacy. We hear a lot about you know, top-down support. You know, what does that really mean? It means you know, the senior executives are, are placing bets around and linking, demonstrably linking, the data and the, the, the role of data, data as an asset, into their strategies and then messaging it out and being specific around the types of investments that are going to reinforce that business strategy. So that's absolutely critical. And then literacy, absolutely fundamental as well because it's not just the executives and the data scientists that have to get this, it's the guy in ops that you're trying yeah. to get to. They need to understand you know, not only tools, but and it's less about the tools, but it's the techniques so it's not the approaches being used are, are more transparent. And, and that you know, th they're starting to also understand uh, you know, the issues of privacy and, and data usage rights. Um, that's, that's also something that we can't leave at the curb with all this innovation. Well, it's also yeah. you know, believing in that there's an imperative. I mean, there's a lot of, for all the talk about digital transformation, and you hear it everywhere, everybody's trying to get digital yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of complacency in the organization, in the lines of business, in operations, to say, hey, we're actually doing really well. You know, we're in financial services or healthcare. It really hasn't been disrupted. Everybody says, oh, it's coming, it's coming. But there's still a lot of, well, I'll be retired by then, or, you know, hanging well, on actually, to the it's, past. Well, it's actually, it's also the fact that, um, you know, like in the previous generation, like, you know, I, if I had to go do a shopping, I would go into a shop, and if I want to buy an insurance product, I would call my insurance agent. But today, the new world, it's just a tap of my screen. I have to go from Amazon to some other, uh, some other mm -hmm. app. Mm -hmm. And this is real. This is what is happening to all of our clients. Previously, they, they thought that customers bucketed them in different experience buckets. It's not anymore. Right. It's real in yeah. front of them. So if you don't get into the digital transformation, a customer is not going to discount you by saying, oh, you are not Amazon, so I'm not going to expect that. You're still on my phone and you're only two ta taps away. <laughs> So you have to become well, real with digital. I was a little surprised that you said you see the next the next stage as being decision support rather than customer experience because we hear that for CEOs customer experience is top of mind right now. Oh you know, yeah. This no, there is are a natural approach. Well, there are two differences, right? One is external facing is absolutely the customer, internal facing it's absolutely the decision making, because that's how they are separating the internal versus the external. And uh, you know, most of the meetings that we go to, uh, customer insights is the first place where analytics is starting, mm -hmm. where data is being cleaned up, where questions are being asked about, can I master my uh, customer records? Can I do a good master of my vendor list? Mm -hmm. That is where they start, but e all of that leads to good decision making to support the customers. So it's, it's like that external towards the internal view. Well, and b back to the offense versus defense and the shift. I mean, it, it absolutely is on the offense side. So it's, yep. it is with the customer. And that's a more direct link to the business strategy. So it's get, that's the area that's gained the money, the support, and people feel like it's it, they're making an impact with it there. When it's, it's down here in some admin area, it's below the waterline, right. and you know, even though it's important and it flows up here, it doesn't get the visibility. So that's the big show. Guys, great conversation. Good Thank, to see thanks Thank for you coming so on. Yeah. We got to leave you. it there. Yep, um, Thank you for watching. We're right back with our next guest, Dave Vellante with Paul Gillen from MIT CDOIQ. Right back. You're watching the Cube.